Let's uh, push a little farther in the detective's mantra of motive, opportunity, and means, and uh, focus on ministry, motive, opportunity, and means. Um, I was brought into thinking about this from a friend who was in a wheelchair and in a, uh, a uh, extended care facility, and she was beginning to spend time with people who were dying and uh, talking to them, but mostly being a presence and holding their hand. Um, the understanding is, is that in ministry, uh, we don't have a specific agenda. We go in understanding our own agenda, what it might be. We may have issues with that person or whatever, uh, but we don't. Um, we don't take those in um, to focus on the person from our point of view, but from their point of view. This mirror is very much the way we approach people who have uh, dementia. We get into their context rather than our context. That's ministry, and you can have sometimes a wonderful conversation with somebody who is um, and full-fledged dementia, uh, but if you're in their context, it makes perfect sense. Um, and it's a conversation. They have a sense of back and forth. And so, motive, opportunity, and means. I was thinking about this in the uh, ministry in the context of social media. I spend some time a day on social media <clears throat> and we don't have much uh, we can do I mean we have the like button and we have the comment button um, you know it's kind of tough sometimes to hit the like button when somebody's ta told us something terrible has happened in their life um, but it is a way it is an affirmation of course there are um, other uh, nonverbal expressions like emojis um, which can uh, which can be helpful too um, the language of social media is proliferating um, but still um, our motive is ministry um, I remember when I was 13 I think uh, 12 or 13 anyway. My dad was the Dean of the Cathedral in um, Faribault, Minnesota, an Episcopal priest, and he was moving to a uh, congregation in uh, what turned out to be Ferguson, Missouri, where I spent my middle school and high school years. Um, we moved there um, in the mid to late 50s, 58 I believe it was, and uh, that moment, um, at least in my life, was moving away from moving into adulthood, moving toward um, my own future, as opposed to my future with my nuclear family. Um, Now, ministry, ministry was introduced to me as a sort of abstract concept by my father handing me the Bible and opening it to Acts of the Apostles and saying, read this. Um, we're going to Ferguson and they do confirmation in, at 12 years old and you're you know, you're 13, so you're going to be out of phase with your contemporaries. So we're going to get you uh, confirm, confirmed here in Minnesota before we leave. And he said, and I want you to do that by reading Acts of the Apostles. Well, Acts of the Apostles, so it's, what, 29 chapters, I think, 28, um, 
uh, written apparently by the same person who wrote Luke. Uh, I, I must say, my 13-year-old mind was uh, was puzzled, shall we say. I read, I read through it. I uh, uh, it seemed kind of uh, antique, I suppose. I don't know if I could come up with quite the right word, but it was, whatever it was, I wasn't resonating with it very much. Um, but what my father was emphasizing was it was the early church. They were feeling their way, trying to figure out what, what, their, what their job was as a, a ministry. And it begins uh, really with the coming of the Spirit and then this great sermon that uh, Peter preached, and 3,000 were uh, baptized from it. Now, I, there's never been a more effective uh, speech in Christian life than that one, if 3,000 people were actually uh, baptized out of that and became part of the community. Um, but, I'm assuming that uh, it happened. Uh, and uh, so I read through this and there were moments that seemed good, interesting, you know. Uh, um, uh, I see that God shows us no partiality, but in every nation, faithful people are. So there's a kind of universality to it that runs through. Um, and then there's all this, there's this guy named Paul who starts out life as Saul and he's uh, persecuting the church and then he's converted on the road to um, Damascus and, uh, and converted and then energetically goes about his life. And then Acts of the Apostles ends sort of without a finish. There's no closure on the, uh, the book itself because we are the closure. And in thinking about how we do ministry, I think it helps to have a, a focus. Um, now, most of us watch television and we probably see um, murder mysteries from now on, and from now and then, and, and, uh, and we know that they look for motive. Why is this person doing this? And they look for um, opportunity. Does this person have an alibi or do they not? Uh, and finally, do they have the means to do this? Um, and sometimes the thrust of the drama is about whether this person actually had the, the dare I say, cojones to be able to carry out this dreadful act. Um, I think that's a good way to think about ministry too, motive and opportunity and, um, and means. I remember... Um, as a hospital chaplain. One of the things as a hospital chaplain, you learn that your own agenda is not what uh, you're bringing to this particular conversation, whatever it may be. And I remember going into this uh, hospital room. I was an intern, uh, uh, chaplain intern at the time, and, and I uh, went into this room, and this woman was packing her bag, and. Uh, she saw I was a chaplain, I introduced myself, and she said, please sit. And then she sat down, and then for about half an hour, she poured out her situation. Now, she'd been five days in the hospital, and they'd found nothing. Uh, but what she related to me was the something that was... Uh, stirring her life up. And it was the fact that her daughter 
uh, her 20-something year old daughter was uh, living with another woman was clearly in a lesbian relationship. Now, this is long before any of our LGBTQ um, people were out of the closet. A few of them were, of course. Uh, there are always those few uh, who, uh, who are extroverted enough and, uh, and they they are out, but everybody else was pretty much in the closet. Most of us didn't even think we knew anybody who was gay because they were in the closet, right? Well, anyway, this woman was telling me about her daughter. Now, she was a Southern Baptist and uh, she loved her daughter. Her daughter was her only family, and uh, but she also hated the fact that she was a lesbian. And her church was telling her, no, 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 this is wrong. And uh, so she, on the one hand, she was thinking this was wrong. On the other hand, she loved her daughter. And she was on tender hooks in the middle of that um, paradoxical situation. And she hadn't created a paradox yet. She was still tense about it. So I listened to her and I tried to give her some um, uh, some people to talk to. She lived in a small Kansas town. Now she wasn't going to get much help there. Um, uh, but she didn't live too far from other towns that might provide her with uh, at least in my case, uh, Episcopal clergy who would uh, listen. Uh, and they would listen because of, uh, because this woman came to them needing help. And most Episcopal clergy that I know respond to that, not with their own agenda. They're not saying, oh, you naughty lesbians. They're saying, no, this woman is in trauma. She loved her daughter. She loved her daughter. And I basically said, kind of go with that one, you know? Love relationship. Where Jesus left us with the idea that we should love one another. You love your daughter. Um, you may not understand what she's up to. Uh, you may not like it. You may, everything in your training has told you that it's wrong, but um, she's in a loving relationship. It's not like she's, you know, uh, Bonnie and Clyde out there shooting up the countryside. She is, uh, she's in a loving relationship. So honor that rather than... Um, this, uh, besides which, um, if you really look at the biblical material, which is limited, Jesus said nothing about it, about uh, same-sex relations, um, but it was a tension created by the early church because the early church was a combination of uh, Judaism and Hellenism, meaning Hellenism, meaning Greek culture. And Greek culture was um, okay with same-sex relations, and and Semitic culture was very much against it. So um, the the church for a long time sort of went with the Jewish strictures, uh, and more recently has begun to open up some parts of Christianity anyway to um, LGBTQ people. Uh, we certainly have in the Episcopal Church. Um, anyway, uh, motive, opportunity, and means. Doing ministry is motive, opportunity, and means. So I've come a long way from that 13-year-old kid who was bewildered by Acts of the Apostles. 
now we are the apostles and we need to do what the apostles do, which is ministry. They created. They created. Peter accepted uh, Cornelius and all kinds of other things happened in the early church that would not have happened had they confined themselves to their Jewish background. The Spirit was flowing. The Spirit is flowing. And the Spirit will change us and change our approach. And if we think about it in terms of our own motive, our own opportunity, and our own uh, means to carry it out, we can carry out the gospel in everyday life as it needs to be carried out. Okay, well, have a great day.